And this happens because of pradnya parad, violations against the natural wisdom of the organism, which of course happens because of the da, of allurement. And <coughs> Sushrutha says that when things are balanced, the physical organism will be healthy. And when the, the, when the mind, the sense organs, and the atma, the soul, or the spirit, are prasanna, that means that the non-physical parts of the organism will be healthy. Prasanna is a, not an easy word to um, uh, translate directly, but I can say that prasanna is not terribly far away from the extremely convenient Danish concept of hygge. <laughs> Forgive me for mispronouncing this fine word, which has become extremely popular in many places, including the U.S. It is a fine word, and that's why we have grabbed it and taken it into English, since we don't have an appropriate word that we could use ourselves. But it is that sense of that everything is really okay. Everything is awesome. Maybe not completely awesome, but okay. And so when the mind and the sense organs feel like they are not craving anything, they are not craving anything because everything is okay. We've had enough to eat. We've had enough to see. We've had enough to smell. In the future, we may need some more. But right at the moment, we're not craving like a bodiless head flying around in space, known as Rahu. The problem, of course, is, and that's why all of us doctors are not going to run out of business anytime soon, <laughs> that generally speaking, what causes your physical body to be healthy is boring. And what causes your mind to be excited is not always good for your physical body. So there is often inside the average human being, a contest going on between am I going to make my body healthier or am I going to do what I really want to do? <laughs> now, the further apart these things get, the more abnormal the organism is going to become and the less healthy it will be. So we have to, if we want to counteract this tendency, which is going on everywhere, we have to try in our own way to get the body and the mind to at the very least communicate with one another. We would like to, to, as to, to assist the body and the mind to find some sort of way to accept the fact that they are different from each other. It's kind of like marriage counseling. And in this particular case, divorce is not feasible. <laughs> there is only death do us part. <laughs> so since divorce is not feasible, we must go for marriage counseling. And sometimes this simply involves having the two partners scream at one another for a while until they are exhausted. And sometimes that's what the body and the mind will do. They will scream at one another. But it is superior to try to get them to acknowledge that neither one of them is going to be able to run things all the time. There has to be cooperation. So then you find in what way, you know, what sort of things do I really want to indulge in and to what degree can I indulge in them and how and how often in such a way that I will be able to indulge in them on an ongoing basis. If I like chocolate, for example, I need to acknowledge that there will be a limitation to the amount of chocolate that I can consume. And I think that we possibly all agree that chocolate, in many ways, is the supreme substance in the universe. <laughs> there are a lot of other things we can, I mean, mango salsa are right on up there. And there's ghee and coffee also. But chocolate, it does a lot of things. and. Nowadays, there's always something to be thankful for. Good quality chocolate is freely available. <laughs> but it, now we've gone from, you know, at least in the U.S., you know, you could get Hershey's chocolate. How depressing is that? 
but now you can get a hundred different kinds of chocolate that are all very good and they come from, much of it has come from ecologically sustainable fair trade, so you can even see the farmers and you can even, they would, might even interview the cacao pod that was used to train, <laughs> create the bar. So there's, you know, you can feel good about it. But you can only eat so much chocolate at a time. You cannot eat all the chocolate that's available. So you have to discover for yourself what is the amount of chocolate that is optimal for my organism. And this is where experimentation comes in. You eat a certain amount and you find out how you feel afterwards. This is always how humans figured things out. This is why the gut brain in the organism is not connected to the rest of the nervous system <coughs> except in a couple of very limited locations. Because your organism, your physical body, knows very well that it cannot trust your mind. <laughs> <laughs> it is fortunate that we only have limited control over things like our breathing, because if we had control over our heart function and our uh, and our, our bowel function and so on, the human race would have ceased to exist a long time ago. Because everybody would have just tied themselves up in knots and everybody would have landed up on their backs on the floor, deceased. So, what we can control and what we often control in a negative way is our breathing. And so the breathing that we have in our organisms is something that we need to establish a healthy niyama for. And sometimes it is sufficient for us, once we have learned how to breathe properly, to consume something and see how that affects the breath. Even more before the question of heartbeat or pulse or something, just when you eat something, does it make you feel that your breathing is able to relax a little bit? Or does it make you feel more tense? Does it cause you to, does it, does, does it affect your breathing in some way? Of course, in order to be able to do this, you have to be able to first breathe very calmly, very deeply, and very abdominally. <laughs> Many people do not breathe with their abdomen, so the first thing that one might want to take on as a niyama is to breathe always with your abdomen. There is one muscle that is involved in breathing in the body, and that is the diaphragm. There are many muscles that are involved with opening the chest so that there will be more space in the lungs for the air to enter. But they are not meant for breathing. However, as we have disconnected ourselves from the earth, this means that we have discouraged a palana for moving down. Apana is the downward for moving force of prana. It is not different from prana. They are the same thing. We can talk about one type of prana, two types of prana, three types of prana, five types of prana, ten types of prana. The only difference between all these types of prana is the direction in which they move. And to some secondary degree, their location. But mainly it's direction. So, prana is prana. And when we think about it in a dual form, upward and downward, inward and outward, uh, catabolism and anabolism, then we think about it as prana and apana. Apana needs to move downward. Apana is moving downward because it excretes things from the body. Urine, feces, flatus, meaning gas, menstrual blood, semen, and the fetus. These are the things that it has to remove from the body. It is harder for apana to work in humans than it is in other animals because we are vertical. It's easier when you are horizontal. But we are vertical, so it's harder for apana to move down for, if, for no other reason that air tends to move up. So one of the first things that a human being needs to do if they want to be healthy especially in the modern world, is to make sure that upon it is moving down health. And a good way to do that is to learn to squat. This is the normal way that human beings 
have sat for a long time before chairs were in the pre-chair. And I had to learn to squat when I was very young. Because up until I was 20, I had no idea that people ever squatted. Then I went to Africa, and everybody was squatting. And it was painful. Then I went to India, and everybody was squatting. And it was painful. But eventually I figured it out. And I also realized that it's actually comfortable to sit this way. Not only is it comfortable, it's open space in the pelvis. And when the space in the pelvis is open, then there's space for a prana to move in. So this is a very good way to get a pana to move. Now, it's also true that, especially if you've never done this before, you may find difficulty in your organism to actually do this. But that's why we have pillows and towels and uh, 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 other things that we can stuff underneath the backside so that at least there can still be flexion of the thighs, opening of the pelvis, and space created, because where there is good space, then the prana can circulate. So space created for the prana to circulate. That is not the only way to encourage prana to move down to the inversions. It's, there are plenty of ways to do it. Forward bends. But finding space and encouraging the breath to move down, this is a very simple but very effective thing to do, especially when one is alarmed fearful, anxious, or whatever, because that's the time when there will be an encouragement for you to become constricted. And when you become constricted, you will be breathing very shallowly and only with these muscles up here. And you will not get rid of enough CO2. And then your body, your brain will say, I need more oxygen. And then you will breathe faster, and then you will start to hyperventilate and have a panic attack. And then what? Then where will you be? You will be in an unhealthy state. Rather than do that, just say no. Breathe more deeply. Remain calm. And make it a point. Even if you were, even if you think you're breathing deeply, make it a point. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh suggests that you, he, he, he encourages people to stop once an hour and just take a few deep breaths interrupt whatever it is you're doing because often what happens you will get involved in doing something and you will forget to breathe interrupt what you're doing remember to breathe it's easy and it's useful and it's free <laughs> like to be said for free